Hi guys, it's the 22nd month of Prompt Squad, coming up to two years, isn't that crazy? I hope you're all enjoying the challenge as I'm really excited to talk about all of this month's entries, plus what I ended up creating for this one too. This month we followed the prompt suggested by Carter called Modern Classics, where we took a piece of famous classical art and then recreated it in our own styles. I'll start with what I made this month and then I'll show you all the amazing art created by the artists of Prompt Squad in the second half of this video. So I really hope I don't make you fall asleep before then. <laughs> so I actually had a good idea of which painting I wanted to do for this one, but I was very hesitant to get started on it because I really wasn't sure just where to begin. At first I thought that I would do this traditionally, but luckily slash unluckily I did get some commission work this month, which meant I ended up moving to digital so I could get it out in time. I think it's kind of a godsend in some ways though, because this one took me a good five or so hours to do at least, and I bet it would have taken probably double or triple that to do traditionally. You know, fair dues to everyone this month who did go that route though. It was really really impressive. So the piece I wanted to paint this month was by Edward Robert Hughes and it's called Midsummer Eve. The reason I wanted to pick it is, I mean other than the fact I think it's a very beautiful painting, is that there's this print of this painting in a cafe in Blackpool where I'm from, which I've been to a lot over the years with my family and my partner and I really relate it to being back in Blackpool and catching up with people. And with it coming up to Christmas and not being able to visit my family this year with everything going on, I kind of wanted to paint something that kind of linked me to that and kind of reminded me of being home, I guess. Yes, I'm feeling sentimental. But yeah, the cafe is called the Renoir Cafe, by the way. It's up on the promenade if you're ever in Blackpool to find it. And all but this painting in there are these prints of Renoir. This is kind of like the only one there that isn't by Renoir. And I've always found it funny that it's kind of just there and mixed in with all the others. Because, you know, I can tell like a similar style to it, like they do have a look of each other but you can also tell it's a different artist quite easily so it's kind of funny that it's just like hidden away in the cafe. So anyway, Hughes was a massive perfectionist, we're going on a bit of an art history lesson for a minute, and that's why he was part of the pre-Raphaelite brotherhood movement during his lifetime. Artists who considered themselves pre-Raphaelite weren't saying, oh I came before Raphael, as it does kind of sound like to me anyway, but they were saying that they preferred how art appeared before the artist Raphael, kind of changed artists' approach and the style that was popular at the time, they kind of like moved away from that aesthetic. Hughes and the Pre-Raphaelites thought no detail should be lost when you do a painting, every part is as important as the rest and should be beautifully detailed. They really liked complex compositions and really bright intense colours too, which I mean I definitely can relate to that, that's definitely something I love too. Hughes was also considered a part of aestheticism, which I found personally quite interesting to learn because I've only really heard that term in reference more to say like interior design work or maybe decorative art in general. I'm not really sure who coined it, but there is a saying you've probably heard, which is art for art's sake. And that's kind of linked especially to the root of aestheticism. They didn't think that art needed to have some great moral or political meaning behind it. It could just be beautiful and yeah, just enjoyed by everyone. 
it doesn't just refer to art mind because writers like Oscar Wilde are some of the main artists known for aestheticism. It would be interesting to know where our members of Prom Squad stand on this issue though because yeah it's an interesting idea. Do you think art should have a greater meaning behind it or are you an artist who likes art for art's sake? <laughs> are you somewhere in the middle? I think it can be funny to hear when someone's taste in others' artwork kind of differs from their own interpretation and their own way of approaching art. So yeah, I think it'd be interesting to start a discussion on this and where you stand. Are you an aestheticist or are you not? Anyway, I'm personally an art for art's sake type of person. I know I've touched on putting messages in my art, but it was many years ago. And back when I did it, I was kind of in this phase of taking photographs. I was very big on photography too. And I especially had to take photographs of myself as none of my friends really wanted to model for me as much as I wanted them to. A few did. I had some very good friends to be honest, but it meant a lot of my political art that I ended up doing because it was based on me. It was more about being a young woman, <laughs> which no one is interested in. And now I'm an old woman and they're even less interested in it. <laughs> I'm just joking, but it's not something that I gravitate towards personally now. It's something I've kind of, I think, moved past a bit. But one of the reasons I love doing Prompt Squad and painting is more for the escapism and a general positivity. I think painting just makes me happy and when it doesn't I don't do it I'll just take a break and do something else and so with that I think it matters to me that things like prompt squad or like painting and the art that I create is this positive experience and I feel like that's how art should be you know if that's how you feel when you create it that's how I feel it should come across I guess but anyway I'm going to stop talking about myself for once. <laughs> this painting was really interesting to do. I feel like I learned a lot looking into the details that Hughes did in his painting. Working through the background especially really made me think about shape, form and light. I'm always trying to keep my backgrounds very simple so I don't take away from the foreground, but Hughes has this way of making really detailed backgrounds that just complement and almost wrap around his characters. I really hope I can take what I've learned from this and from here and bring it more into my own art too because I really like how he can have a background and foreground together, he doesn't have to sacrifice one for the other. I also love how he uses light, all of the warm oranges and pastel blue and cold tones in the shadows. I think I've said probably a lot of times in the past by now but I try not to use black for shadows but looking at his paintings for a while you see how many muted colour tones that he plays with and he gives his paintings a lot of depth by playing with colour and shadow and at the same time they're just not loud, they're not like too loud pieces of work. I really love that about his painting. You'll have to tell me in Prompt Squad what you guys have learnt from your experience with this prompt too. What did you learn from the artist you followed? And that's how it turned out. My version of Midsummer Eve by Edward Robert Hughes. I hope you enjoyed watching it and hearing how it was made as much as I did painting it. Now, on to the rest of Prompt Squad. Dave created two pieces for this prompt and the second one is a surprise, I won't spoil it just yet. So the first was The Scream by Edvard Munch. I am sorry, by the way, with how many artist names I know I'm going to just absolutely ruin <laughs> in the next like 10 minutes. Okay, uh, it's a struggle of only reading names and never hearing them out loud, you'll have to forgive me. But Dave's version really focuses on the shapes and the composition of the piece and he decides to bring out the colours in a much more vibrant way and create this oh, his own beautifully toned palette. He's brought out the red warm tones and the cold blues and then clashed them together in his piece to create a really dramatic interpretation of the painting which I personally think really works brilliantly. And in his second piece, he seems to get bit by the Vermeer book, like quite a few of you did this month in Prop Squad, and recreated the girl with the pearl earring. Now, to be honest, I was very happy to see how many of you decided to take on this painting in particular, as it's one of my partner's favourites and my favourite paintings too. In Dave's version, he played with the focus of the painting and really pronounced the earring in his version. He always adds this humour that I love, but I think even more so, I love how he did the brush strokes and the textures in his version of it. It's very vibrant, it's very expressive. I really enjoy that about it. 
Far Photos also created two pieces this month, the first being The Birth of Venus by Botticelli. I love that Far Photos blurred the background that they painted around their Venus because not only did it truly bring her into the foreground of the work, but it also kind of emphasised this painterly, smoothed brushstrokes that kind of made me feel like I was seeing this mixture of traditional and digital art together. It was such a cool effect and I really love it, I think it's very well done. Far Photos also created their version of The Water Lilies by Monet, which I was really happy to see. I noticed they mentioned in their comment that they'd seen them in person and I have also been lucky enough to see some of Monet's water lilies at Cardiff Museum. I really recommend visiting the museum if you ever get the chance to, as they do have a pretty much permanent exhibition of some of Monet's work there. Fofos also took on this digitally, but again focused on the brush strokes and portraying the light and colours in this really vibrant and abstract way too. Truly wonderful work there, Fofos. I, I just love it. I love your two takes. Lisbeth also made two. <laughs> I'm starting to see a pattern here, guys. <laughs> so her first was The Son of Man by René Magritte. I always think this must be one of those paintings that most people would recognise when they saw it, but maybe not know the name of the artist or the name of the piece of art. I know I'm one of those people anyway, because I had to check. <laughs> I love that Lisbeth brought her signature characters into her version. Maybe this is the son of foxes. <laughs> it's so cute and I like to imagine that the fox is balancing that apple on the end of his nose. Maybe he's a fan of art too, maybe he's recreating it. <laughs> the second piece she created was also inspired by Vermeer's Girl with the Pearl, but in her style she took the composition and then played with the shapes of it to create her own story in pencil. I love the doodles in the background that she did and that she brought them into the face's background so that the two then relate to each other even though one's in full colour and the other's in black and white. I've always thought that there was this real sadness to that painting as well so I mean that sounds to odd to say to enjoy but I did enjoy seeing Lisbeth play with that in her version by making it a bit of a sadder story. Tara also recreated a piece by Monet but she focused on the painting The Woman with the Parasol for her interpretation. I'm not sure if you guys will have seen this film but there's a scene in Ghibli's Wind Rises that really reminds me of this painting and in particular Tara's version of this painting. The watercolour work is just truly stunning. I love the mixture of textures, especially in the rich blues and then against those white negative space of the plain paper. I think Tara's compositions have this gorgeous flow to them. She's always bringing it to art and I really loved seeing this version of that painting. It feels very much a modern classic to me. Emily also recreated the Vermeer girl with the pearl earring painting this month in her style. Gosh, how many times am I going to say it? And I think this has to be one of the most striking versions, with those dead eyes and the distortion that she's played with whilst painting. I love the use of these thick, harsh strokes of paint. It has this choppiness that makes it feel almost carved or done in oil or acrylic, but then digitally it's just a, a great clash of the two. And I think it's great to form these textures without the need or use of overlays in the painting, especially digitally. I just think you get it anyway through the style of her painting. I love in general how expressive everyone's styles are, to be honest. I think that's something that's really come across to me, looking at the work in this month's challenge. I hope the lumper doesn't mind, but I burst out laughing when I saw her take on Collier's Lady Godiva painting. It is just absolutely fantastic. I had to put the two together in this video just so you could see how brilliant her version is. Even the wink to the background made me chuckle. I love that she used her characters to recreate this classical scene and the expressions of the characters are just fabulous. Each month I think you see Halumpa's style just keep growing and becoming more defined and growing into this true like classical children's illustrator style. I can't wait to pick up my first book by her when it is made. I'm sure I'm not going to be the only one. Tea Light was the only one of us to take on a sculpture as their recreated piece of art this month and I won't lie I did have to look up the artist though I really enjoyed doing so. To be honest, that's probably been one of my favourite things about this prompt, getting to research a bit of classical art again. It's been a big highlight of the challenge. So Tea Light's piece was inspired by the sculptures of... Let's give it a go. 
Modigliani? Modigliani? I don't know. But they modernised their work and added these vibrant colours which truly brought them to life. Just the colours, the composition, those headphones. <laughs> it's such a good take on the artist's style, but in her, in her style, it's just so clever. And seeing them mesh together, it's just wonderful. Such a creative idea, I think it's fantastic. Carter joined the Vermeer Club too <laughs> and created their version traditionally and it seems with another more modern artist in mind too, maybe a bit of Emily by <laughs> weaving in a few of those uh, doodly like sketches into the weaves of the clothing too. I love the vibrancy of Carter's colours and I think the colour <laughs> of the skin tone is the thing that really stands out to me. It's just perfect, Cara. I don't know how you did it. I really wanted to mention it because I've always struggled with skin tone, especially, especially traditionally. But to create the perfect skin tones with this strong shading and lifelikeness to it that Carter did, I really think it should be applauded. It's fantastic painting, Carter. I hope you're proud of it. And finally, we have Troy, who, I mean, You've got me speechless, Troy. Your interpretation of The Death of Marat by David is, is mind-blowing. I mean, the blending, the shading, they're both beautiful. And I love that in your version, you've made it so the colours have been lightened and you've added more contrast to your version because it really highlights how many details that you've noticed and then added into your version. It kind of makes it clearer to see. I think it's beautiful work, Troy. I'm going to be waiting for you to make a tutorial sometime now on how you blend pastels and pencils because they're always so smooth. I don't know, every time I'm like, how does it do it? <laughs> and yeah, that is all the members of Prom Squad this month and all your takes on the prompt modern classic. I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. And now for the next prompt, which is a bit more Christmassy themed, which I hope you'll enjoy. And it was suggested by our own far photos. The prompt is snow globe. Basically, just create a piece of art inspired by the word snow globe. I'm personally imagining that you'll design your own snow globe, but if that doesn't excite you as an idea, don't feel completely tied to that interpretation of it. Take on the prompt in your own way. That is the fun of these challenges. It's not like You've got to be completely tied to it, okay? Just have fun with it. I can't wait to see what kind of snow globes you guys create this Christmas. If you're wanting to join Prompt Squad, just add the hashtag Prompt Squad to the art you create this month, either here on YouTube or Instagram, and I'll make sure to add it to next month's video. The deadline will be the 1st of January, so hopefully we'll still be in the 12 days of Christmas by the time the video is up and ready. If you have any thoughts on what you would like the next prompt to be, you can always suggest them down in the comments or come chat with us over on Instagram. The Prompt Squad is a wonderful community of artists and I'm sure any or one of them on there would be happy to help you if you have any questions either here or in the comments or on Instagram. Everyone's lovely, so come join us. Anyway, I hope you're all wrapped up warm and are looking after yourselves. I am really sorry if my voice got funny at any point in this video. I've been guzzling lockets between recordings, so I tried not to sound too congested, but I'm sorry if I did. Please take care of yourselves and I'll chat to you all soon. Happy holidays!